Wisconsin District Assembly, District uh, 55, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Winnebago County. I am Deb Andrews, and I will be your moderator this evening. This event is being recorded and can be accessed at lwbwinnebago.org, your Spectrum Community Channel, and the City of Nina website. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government. Our mission is to inform citizens about major public policy issues and about candidates seeking office. We do not support or oppose any political party or any candidate. Wisconsin Assembly <coughs> District 55 includes Nina, the west side of Fox Crossing, the towns of Nina and Clayton, the southeast corner of the town of Greenville, and the southwest side of the town of Grand Chute. Our timekeeper for this evening is Connie Canitz down below, and she will signal the candidates about um, how time is progressing. Thank you for keeping your answers short so we may cover as many questions as possible. We already have quite a stack accumulated. If you go over time, I will stop you. The audience, your questions are welcome. If you haven't already submitted a written question, we ask that you do so. Raise your hand if you have a question that's filled out in one of these sheets, and one of us will come around um, and pick it up. Your question must be for both candidates, and we reserve the right to reword questions for clarity and brevity. A ground rule for the forum is that any demonstration of support or opposition to the candidates or their positions will be out of order. We wish to get as many questions as possible to help voters learn about as many issues as possible, so please remain respectful. Our two candidates for this evening, in order selected by a draw, are to my immediate right, the incumbent representative Mike Rorkast, a Republican, and his challenger, Dan Sherrill, Democrat. Welcome both of you, and audience, thank you for attending tonight. Let us thank both candidates with our applause. thank also the City of Nina for allowing us to use their facility. Now each candidate will have three minutes to make an opening statement and again by the draw, um, Mr. Rorkast, you will start first. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you <clears throat> the League of Women Voters for coordinating this event and uh, thank you for everybody who showed up. As mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Rorkast. I'm finishing my second term as your State Assembly Representative in Madison. Um, on the state budget committee, which is probably the most, uh, probably has the most work of any of the committees. We have to uh, work on the governor's proposed budget. We make uh, many changes to that budget, and then eventually we have to shepherd that through both houses of the legislature. So my second term was very busy in that process, and I hope to continue that in a third term. In general, I think that there's tons of good things to talk about in the state of Wisconsin. We have record low unemployment. More people are working than ever before. We have wages going up significantly. We have 90 to 100,000 open job positions in the state right now. Everywhere I go here in the Fox Cities, whether it's to a manufacturer, a hospital, a doctor's office, a not-for-profit organization, by the way, I'm on the board of two not-for-profits, all of them are struggling with the same thing. They can't find enough qualified people to fill open positions. So that is one of the three key things that I want to continue to focus on. I was able to do, have a bill passed that focused $7 million of money to help address the attraction and retention issues of the state. I also don't want to continue focusing in two other areas. Healthcare is one. I hear from many people that healthcare cost and healthcare prevention, early diagnosis is critical. I have worked on several bills, but there's more that I want to continue to do. That would also include mental health services as well, particularly school-based mental health. The last item that I think is uh, imperative that we fix is a long-term transportation uh, funding system. I've already volunteered, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I volunteered to take on transportation if I'm re-elected and put back on the Joint Finance Committee. I think that we need to have a long-term funding solution that ensures that we have not only money for the highway systems that we have, 
but also for the local roads because we have not only needs of having highways to connect our cities, we also need to ensure that our rural roads are just as good because of our strong dairy and agricultural industry here in the state of Wisconsin. So health care, transportation, and continuing to address getting more qualified workers here for open positions, those are the three key areas that I hope to continue to work on in the next legislative session. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sherrill, will you please give us your opening statement? Thank you very much for uh, everyone being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Uh, my name is Dan Sherrill. Uh, I've been a resident here for all my life. I'm married, four children. I worked all my life here at a, a place called American National Can in Bemis. I was a millinery you know, pipe fitter and I retired there recently and this was not going to be my second job. I just felt compelled because I think we need different changes and I think we need different routes in our, our community, in our state. And what I would propose to do is my biggest, biggest main concern is the money in politics. I'm just a common person that I can see that money rules everything in our state. Our, our country everywhere money is money and it, it's taking over everything so I think we need to address that issue I think it everything under it is secondary until you get that out we will not have our democracy back my second thing is health care badger care I think we need to uh, badger care for everyone in the state we need to fix our health care not just talk about the prices of, of our health care. We need to actually fix it, and that would make a good goal of, of uh, doing it. Um, education, I think we have done the service to our educational system. I think it's a basic for our society. I think we need to address it in ways that we are not doing right now. Uh, green energy, I think we should have been doing green energy for many, many years. Uh, it's important to our future generations. So uh, that is a big push for me. And I'm a proponent of cannabis. I think we should legalize it for, for medical. I think there's very, very good things to do with the cannabis. And if it makes sense, let's put it on the table and see if it makes sense to recreationalize it. I don't want to cause problems in, in the state, but I think other states have, have good history of, of uh, the income it generates. And some of those states actually have surplus so those are my agenda items, and they, they are they're the talking points of, of my camp campaign. And not necessarily everyone is agreeing with that, but you know what? I think we need to be bold in our, in our direction here. Thank you. Now we'll begin with the audience questions. And some questions were submitted online earlier. And this question relates to um, federal aid. Will you support accepting federal aid if it is offered for transportation and health care and other purposes? And this time we'll have Dan Sherrill go first. Uh, I guess I wouldn't understand why we wouldn't take it. I think uh, there's a lot of good uses we could use it. We could use it to fix up our health care for sure. Uh, our roads are in desert, you know, are, are crumbling. I can ride my bike out in the country and in the city. And those roads are actually, some of them are turning to gravel, so I surely would uh, accept any money that the federal government would give us. And since you have a little time, could you address the health care side of it? Um, yeah. Can you uh, restate it? Would you accept supporting federal aid for health care as well? Yes, I would. Uh, it just makes sense to take the aid. I think we have we have people here that uh, I've been talking to. They don't even have insurance anymore, and the ones that do, the middle class is getting squeezed out of the health care. So I think we should take any aid that's available. Thank you, Mr. Barkan. Same question. Great. Thank you. Uh, regarding both of those, I mean, yes, uh, first in transportation, we already receive uh, millions of dollars of federal transportation funds. Matter of fact, we received more than what we were anticipating, and being a member of joint finance, we reallocated some of those monies. We particularly, we, uh, we put them toward bridges here in the state of Wisconsin that were many of which needed to have uh, uh, necessary repairs. So we are already uh, maximizing what we can uh, get in federal dollars, and we've received more uh, from the current administration than we have in the past. 
Uh, regarding health care, we also in this last session actually passed a law where we tapped into Medicaid uh, funding for reinsurance of people who are on the exchanges in order to try to lower the cost of the premiums for health insurance if they're getting health care through the exchange. This wouldn't affect employer plans or people on Badger Care, but we took federal dollars, put state money to it, actually got about, I think, two to one federal to state, and we are actually, a we were able to put a reinsurance plan in place. We actually had a provider who left the exchange because they couldn't, they, it wasn't viable under the ACA. They've actually come back into the state of Wisconsin. So there's actually, because of what we did, there's more competition and there's uh, going to be lower, either lower increases or actually decreases in some of the premiums that people on the exchange will have. Thank you. Mr. Rorkasting on this one. And this question is a two part question about school vouchers. What is your opinion of school vouchers? And do you support holding private voucher schools to the same standards as public schools? Uh, I do support school choice. I have from the, the time that I started running. I think that the, the best the solution for education is to give parents as much of a choice as they can to provide that best choice of a school for their particular child. Um, I have two sons and we utilized both private schools, we utilized public schools, and we utilized a public charter school. Those were the best choices for our kids. We also actually for our younger son used the public and private uh, he had an eye um, special he was a special ed child early he had uh, speech uh, reading issues and um, uh, so we actually saw how the private school that he was in worked with the public school and now he's of all things a musical theater major at UW Stevens Point and he doesn't mind me telling the story because this shows that I believe, and it's not just personal, I hear this from many parents. Now it doesn't mean that we don't support a public education. Over 95% of what the state funds for education goes into the public school system. Um, but I think that in the, the school choice program is only available for parents that actually have lower income. So it's not open to every, I think there's, there's some misunderstandings about it. In terms of the second question, we have made some improvements into that. I, I think that there's always room that we could look at making that better if there's specific issues that people are concerned about. Thank you, just stay on the same question. I guess uh, the school choice, I think I would disagree with totally. Uh, I'm not on board with it at all. I see and read that we are supporting those schools and, and there's 70% of the people already in that voucher system already work in that private school. So this, this was not supposed to be operated this way. It was supposed to help the poor people have a choice in Milwaukee and we have expanded it so far we are actually taking money out of our school systems and hurting those individuals. As for the uh, special education, we are actually have not funded our special education, uh, uh, increased it for up to a decade. And those costs still went up and the kids are still in that school. How Those, those services are getting cut. So we, it, I would not support even uh, holding them uh, holding their feet to the fire, because I don't think we should be doing it at all. I think we should be sticking our money in our public schools, and if we got a problem with them public schools, then we need to address that issue and find out why they're not working, not, not, not putting more money in a, another school system. Right now, I think we are, are trying to support two school systems, and we have no transparency, and I think that's very wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you'll go first on this one. Um, this is um, a question about e-cigarettes and teenagers. Annually, 2,600 Wisconsin kids become new daily smokers, and nearly one-third of Wisconsin high schoolers have tried e-cigarettes. The FDA recently labeled cigarette use among children an epidemic. What are some concrete steps the legislature can take to see those numbers decrease? 
I'm not real familiar with it, but I would not support uh, uh, anything that's got to do with that because I think e-cigarettes are, are just as bad as regular cigarettes. And I think it's probably a fad and it just kind of uh, leads into maybe a, a slight addiction. But I think uh, maybe we need to raise the law or the age limit on that or, or look, into, look into different ideas on it. I'm not, I'm not positive. Can I just clarify that you said e-cigarettes or regular cigarettes? That's what I'm sorry, I didn't hear it correctly. E-cigarettes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so with e-cigarettes, I think that there there is an opportunity to to look at regulation. Um, there's still, I think, a lot of unknowns about e-cigarettes in terms of their impact and particularly on youth. So I do think that we should be looking at regulations, whether that's age, the placement of those in behind the counters, but there's also, I think, funding for education too. The biggest reason that I believe that we really stopped the smoking problem was we started funding more education that smoking is hazardous to your health. And that's really what turned that tide around, I believe anyway, from going, and I grew up during when cigarettes were very legal, as many, some people in here did, and a lot of some wouldn't even know that you used to be able to smoke them anywhere in your office, on a plane, whatever. I mean, I remember those days, and it was awful. So we don't obviously want to go back to those days. So we have to be very careful about the e-cigarettes the e, the e for health reasons. Um, some of the larger companies are starting to regulate, the, I guess, quote unquote, regulate themselves. So uh, Altria recently did that. Uh, they are starting, and I'd have to look at the specifics, but they're starting to put some of their own restrictions. But I don't know if that's going to be enough. Again, we have to look at what's best for our kids. And if these are being marketed to youth and we don't know the health effects, we have to figure out what to do at the state level to ensure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rorkas, this is another health care question. We'll start with you. According to America's Health Ranking in 2017, the state of Wisconsin ranks 47th in combined state and federal public health funding per capita. Given this lack of funding for public health in Wisconsin, how will you as an elected official, official prioritize funding so public health can do what works best, prevent diseases and health-related threats? I'm sorry, could you, the first sentence, could you repeat? According to America's Health Ranking in 2017, the state of Wisconsin ranks 47th in combined state and federal public health funding per capita. Okay. Um, I guess I'm not sure, uh, I guess I'm not sure the, 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 the question, public health funding, I mean, the, the status of Wisconsin's health care system, the, the, the state's health care system is one of the best in the country, actually, in terms of outcomes and results. We do, uh, we could do better in terms of cost, but the outcomes in the state of Wisconsin um, has always been extremely high. And I know that not as only as a legislator, but I worked as an HR person here in the Fox Valley at two large corporations that had multiple facilities around the, around the country, well, around the world, but around the United States. And the healthcare system in Wisconsin is one of the best that exists. Now, there are certain things in terms of public health. I mean, uh, we've got Badger Care, we've got other programs that provide public health systems if there's opportunities that we could improve that, that would be an area uh, that we could look at. I do, there is another area that is one, and that has to do with um, um, being better prepared for like diseases of, uh, I'm not, I can't think of a term, um, working with the CDC more closely. So that would be an area of opportunity. But I mean, to say our healthcare system is not adequately funded, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm Perplexed. Well, I looked online a little bit and I've, I've done some research on it and I think Wisconsin ranked number 23rd. Uh, and when I looked around and, and I was comparing, I looked at Minnesota just for fun and, and they're ranked number four. And I looked and they're accepting all the government money from our federal government and we did not do that here in our state, Medicaid. And I, I question why we didn't do that. We have many people that are not insured here because of that move. So I think we should do that. I should think we should take that money from the government. I should even think we should uh, take an, our own money. I would rather have my tax money go to uh, funding for 
for uh, healthcare in the state than it goes to uh, big corporations or uh, tax cuts for the rich. I think we need to do a better job at this. I think we need to take care of our people here in our state. So when I look and compare, there's a, a different ideas be between Wisconsin and Minnesota. Minnesota is a progressive state, and here in Wisconsin, we seem to have gone to a conservative state. And some of the conservative state is okay, but I think some of it's not, and, I, and the health care is not. So I think we need to do a better job at our health care. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sherrill, let's we'll start with you again on this one. So it's another question about the education system in the state. And the question is, what ideas do you have to address the teacher shortage in Wisconsin? Well, the teacher shortage here has, I think, been caused by uh, Act 10. And uh, I think we need to address that Act 10. We have made uh, uh, Wisconsin a, a very not welcome place for teachers, and even sometimes, I think, for work, workers. So I think we have a shortage here because our work environment is not what it should be. Uh, we, we have attacked our teachers, and when you attack a teacher, you're attacking a, a pretty good group of people. So I think we demonized them. I think it was wrong. I think we need to welcome the teachers. Our teachers are, are teaching our kids our basic society. It's, it's a building block here. And we need to address that. So I think we need to welcome teachers, not demonize them. So that, that would be my, my point. Thank you. And this question, I believe it's Mr. Rourke has to this one. He didn't yes, answer it. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you, could, you I'm sorry. Now, could, could you repeat the question? Because sure. I guess like, I'm what, sorry. I, what ideas do you have to address the teacher shortage in Wisconsin? Um, first, I just want to say my, my younger son is only two years out of a public high school, and I know many of the teachers at that public high school, and to say that they feel demonized is, is a stretch, but I'll, I'll go on record to that, and, um, and I'll say that, I'll also add that they provided my son and many other people an outstanding, fabulous education. Our public school systems are some of the best in our country still are some of the best in our country. And I have very recent experience with a public school with my own child, and I don't know what other example can be better than that. Um, in terms of the teacher shortage, yes, there's a shortage of all positions. In terms of teacher shortage, uh, there's, I think, several things that we need to be doing. There's particular shortages in math and science. We need to be working closer with the middle schools and encouraging kids to get interested into teaching, going into the STEM fields, not just for uh, practicing in engineering or in healthcare, but also to translate those skills into teaching. One of the bills that I did, I mentioned earlier, was to help attract and retain people in the state. Part of that money is being used to do outreach to the graduates from the UW system that are no longer in Wisconsin. We're going to, we are outreaching to them to try to encourage them to move back. We are also proactively going out to the military bases to encourage people coming off military service. Now, they may not have education degrees, but they could have an interest, and there are already programs that they could go back to school to get their education degrees. So that's what we need. We need to be increasing the pool of people that are potential teachers. And if they don't have the right credentials, then we need to be either using the existing programs or expanding those existing programs, either with need-based or scholarship-based programs to get people to go into those high-demand fields, particularly math and sciences, the ones that are hurting the most. Thank you. And Mr. Rourke, we'll start with you again on this one. This is another question about teaching and it's about school violence. What are your views on arming teachers as a possible solution to gun violence in our nation's schools? I don't think arming teachers is a very wise idea. I think that having um, armed resource officers that are basically police officers in the schools, that would be a school's decision. Not, I'm not, I don't think that we should legislate that they either should do it or not do it. A lot of local high schools here in the area have those but they have to have a significant amount of training. So I would rather leave that up to each school's district if they choose that. But in terms of allowing teachers 
to have uh, weapons in school, I think that there are too many risks. The biggest concern that I would have is the student or somebody getting access to that gun in some way. So I don't think that it's a wise idea. I think that there are better ways to look at school safety. Um, we recently put $100 million in the grants for school safety. Most of that has to do with physical safety, physical, uh, physical safety in the buildings in terms of limiting access, putting better security barriers in place. Uh, there's ways that teachers can basically secure the doors from inside so that nobody could get into those rooms. There's a lot of things that can be done to secure our schools and those that do not involve weapons and those should be done first in my opinion and again if they if they if the school chooses they need to have good reasons for having an armed resource officer i know nina did have one at one time don't know if they still do if they or if they changed that practice thank you thank you uh, i do not support any guns on the, uh, school properties i think it's a big mistake uh, I do I do support some of Mike's ideas about trying to uh, prevent uh, people coming into the schools, but everyone here in this room, when they went to school, the biggest thing you had to worry about is if you had a cigarette down at the corner and you got caught, or you had a beer at noon or something like that. Nowadays, we have a bigger problem, and I think we need to figure that out. Why are these kids going off like this? They're, they're, we have to do the root cause of the problem, not just put up physical barriers. Because when you put up physical barriers, and, and you don't really solve the problem, you just make it a little harder for them to, to accomplish their goal of killing people. So I, I think we need to put those barriers in place for now, but I think we need to look at the root cause. And there could be a lot of root causes on this. Uh, our society is failing, some of us, in some ways, and we need to sit down and figure out why. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Sherry, <coughs> you start with this one. This is a question about the minimum wage. Do you favor a $15 minimum wage for Wisconsin? And please support your answer. I do support it. For many years, we have not had any minimum wage increase in this state, or very little. And people are working one and two and three jobs just to make ends meet and maybe rent a place and, and, and those people don't carry insurance anymore. I've talked to people about that. This, uh, when, you, when you have to work that much, where are they going to get the money for food, for clothing? Uh, it goes on and on. But if you don't have enough money to put back in our economy, how can you keep that economy going strong? If, if, if you don't have the money, where can you buy a car? You don't get stuff free. You need the money. So I think if we raise the minimum wage, it would increase spending throughout the state because those kids, or people, I should say people, because they're, they're older people too, would it? They would have to spend their money on basic, basic stuff. Maybe they would buy a new stove. Maybe they would buy a new refrigerator. I, I've seen people, they are pretty destitute, and you don't really see it in this city as much as you do unless you start walking doors and talking to a lot of people. So I support $15 an hour, and I don't even think that's really a livable wage anymore now, nowadays. So you'd almost have to have two jobs at $15 an hour to make a decent, decent living. Thank you, Mr. Rourke, same question. Okay. Um, I think the market is basically the best determinant of what wages should be with some floor, so I, I could not support a $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, I think when you look at almost all of the reputable studies, it shows that it leads to unemploy higher unemployment and lower hours. Um, the, one of the, the economics professors at UW-Madison has studied this extensively and has said that basically it does not provide the economic uh, benefit that many people think that it does. Um, a couple of just, again, the, the job market right now is so hot for all different jobs, it's very, it would be very hard not to find a job for $15 an hour. Hobby Lobby is hiring $15.70, that's on their board, full benefits if you work full time. 
Zebra Technologies, a printing company up in Greenville, starts high school students 18 years old at $14 an hour, plus benefits, four weeks vacation, first year. Right out of high school, they'll take, send them to the technical college. Within a few years, they'll be making over $20 an hour. There's multiple job opportunities, whether it's at Pierce Manufacturing, Oshkosh Corporation, Menasha Corporation, uh, if they go into the healthcare field. Apple Computer wants to expand training here in the state of Wisconsin. They've met with me as a member of Joint Finance. They want high school students to get special training in developing apps. The apps that are on iPhones or any phones, but they're business application apps that companies use. In. These positions will pay fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. So I, I guess I, I think what you will do is you will hurt high school students, that entry level worker that works at Subway at McDonald's. They they will not hire those people at fifteen dollars an hour. What they will do is they will automate those front teller jobs and then those jobs will be gone forever. So I I, I think that uh, you know we should Thank we should let the market determine wages in general. Thank you. And Mr. Barkas, we'll start with you on this question, which is about pre-existing conditions. It says, our current attorney general under the auspices of our governor and Republican legislators, legislators has filed a lawsuit with other states that would end the current protections regarding pre-existing conditions for insurance purposes. Do you support this effort, or would you work to end the lawsuit? Uh, there's two, those are two separate items. The lawsuit has to do with the Affordable Care Act in general, which has a pre-existing protect, protection provision. Um, in the assembly, we actually passed a state law that, um, that protects people with pre-existing conditions in the last session. Um, we actually, if you go on to the, into the record, we actually did that. Um, it was, we pulled it as a budget, or as not a budget, we pulled it as a motion on the floor, and it was voted in uh, by Republicans. All the Democrats voted against it um, because, uh, well, I can't say why they voted against it other than for political reasons. But in the assembly, we actually voted for protecting people's um, pre-existing conditions. Personally, I'm supportive of that. Um, like I mentioned, I'm an HR person from, we got rid of pre-existing condition clauses in private industry 20 years ago on our own because we couldn't recruit people otherwise. So, I mean, I don't even, very few companies even would have them, even if they, even if they were allowed to be used, they wouldn't even use them because it would significantly hurt recruiting here into the area. We tried to recruit people here like uh, anybody, if their spouse themselves or a child had a pre-existing condition, they wouldn't take the job unless your health care plan covered it. So most employers, they've gotten rid of that provision long before the ACA ever did. So, but it's good public policy though to protect people with pre-existing conditions. That's why we did it in the, the assembly. Um, if you, if you, it's unfortunate that we weren't able to get it through the Senate. From what I understand, the governor would have signed it if the Senate would have acted on it. Thank you, Mr. Sherrill, same questions. Uh, pre-existing conditions, it shouldn't even be a question. We should all have it. Who doesn't have a pre-existing condition? Almost everybody I know. So it shouldn't even be an issue. Uh, uh, Brad Schimmel shouldn't have uh, filed the lawsuit for that, if that's what it was. Uh, I think we all should have a health care that works for all of us. I think it, we have to get rid of this pre-condition, uh, pre-existing conditions. We need to just we have health care for all of us. I, I just don't know what else to say. We need health care for all of us at work. We start with you on this next one, which is about um, the National Rifle Association. Are you an NRA member? Have you ever accepted NRA donations? Please outline your solution to gun safety. I am not an NRA uh, member. Uh, I have guns. I support having guns. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? Can you repeat, please? Have you ever accepted NRA donations and your solution to gun safety? I have never accepted any uh, uh, contributions. Uh, over $250, and that's uh, from individuals only. Uh, so I think that's important. Uh, I think we need to look at the gun uh, issues. Uh, 
I thought it was a mental health issue, but it's really not a mental health issue. It's a, it's a multifaceted problem with, with guns in our society. Uh, we need to, I think, have gun sensible laws. And, and I don't even know if those are going to work very good. We, I think we need to study this area uh, immensely. We have a, a, a gun craziness in this country, and I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's, uh, we need to address it. Uh, I don't know how else to say that. We, we just have a, a crazy people that want guns, and they're, they're just gun happy. And that's, that's okay, because that's our amendment. Thank you. Mr. Rourke, same question. Great, thank you. Um, so just from the beginning, I am an NRA member, currently have been and currently am. Uh, in my first term, I believe the NRA did give me a, an initial contribution. I haven't received anything, nor have I solicited any contributions from their PAC. Um, I've actually told several people at the doors this last session that I, if they did send me, I would not accept it uh, because I am not happy with certain aspects of the NRA. I am happy that they support the Second Amendment. I am a strong Second Amendment supporter, but I do think that there is certain legislation that, that, that we should be looking at specifically to improve law enforcement and our court systems in getting guns out of the hands of people that are either a danger to themselves or others. There's model legislation that Florida just passed, that Indiana has passed, that we should be looking at that would give, um, again, law enforcement and courts better opportunities to remove guns from people who are identified as potential threats, again, either to themselves or others. That should be the first thing that we possibly, that we should be doing. And I don't know that the NRA would be supportive of that. And if they're not, then I don't want their, because I think that, that sometimes they need, to, they need to be willing to compromise on some of their Second Amendment points. Um, I also think that we need to increase penalties even further. We did last session for people who do what's called straw purchases, and that's when somebody knowingly purchases a gun for somebody who's not allowed to have a gun. We made it a felony. So if person A buys a gun for person B who is a convicted felon that is not allowed to have a gun and knows that, it is now a felony for that person to, to buy that and then sell that gun to that person, and they'll be going to jail. We need to be looking at better ways of getting, of in, of in improving our laws to ensure that people aren't getting around the systems. Many people are not allowed to have guns for either felony reasons or mental health reasons. We need to ensure that those databases are kept up to date and we may need to make sure that they don't have access to weapons. We can't solve that totally, but we need to do everything we can. And Mr. Rorkas, we start with you with this question, which is about Kimberly Clark. What is your position on providing financial support to Kimberly Clark? Um, I, I authored the bill that did support uh, providing tax incentives to Kimberly Clark to keep those good paying jobs here in the Fox Cities. And I did it for several reasons. And I've heard from a lot of people who support it, and I've heard from people who are against it. And I think on, on balance, it was the right thing to do. I. Um, I shifted to the side of we need to keep good paying jobs here in the area that are long term and viable. The other thing that I think people may forget about Kimberly Clark jobs is they are less sensitive to the economic ups and downs. We're in an economic upturn right now, but a downturn will occur at some point. And some of those jobs in other companies are going to go down, but Kimberly Clark's jobs don't go down in the economic downturns like many other jobs. So I think it would have been a disservice if I didn't do everything I could to keep those good paying jobs here in, in Wisconsin. The other thing is when a company starts to reduce their footprint, meaning the number of people that they have in an area, the smaller it gets, then they just keep making it smaller and smaller. I want to keep Kimberly Clark here. They've been here over 100 years. Um, we offered them a very generous incentive package Maybe we could have offered them a lesser uh, amount than what we did, but I think that we did the right thing. We erred on the side. If we erred at all, if you want to argue that we erred, we erred on keeping good paying jobs here in the Fox Cities, and I'll do that any day of the week. Thank you. Mr. Sheriff, same question. I agree with Mike and some of it. Uh, we need those jobs here, but those jobs, uh, they're going to go anyway. If we don't continue supporting those jobs, we support every business in this state. I, I, where do we draw the line? 
I've talked to people also that support it, and I've even talked to people that work there and are mad because they are they are taking uh, uh, pay cuts to stay in their own positions at the Kimberly Clark. So we give a, a multi-million dollar company tax incentives to stay here, and then we turn around. They turn around and cut the uh, uh, their wages. Well. How does that work? Do they do they need more money? Where do we draw the line? Where 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 do we get a company that says we need the money to stay here, or the little mom and pop shop that just closed down the street here? Why don't we support them all? Where was Gilbert's? Why don't we support Gilbert's? Uh, Gladfelters. I mean, you can go on and on of the, of the jobs that are lost here. Manufacturing jobs are not the jobs of the future. The jobs of the future, I believe are energy jobs. Those will be good paying jobs and they will be high paying jobs and it will be green energy for a clean environment and a good Wisconsin clean energy. That's where I stand on that issue. Thank you. And Mr. Sherrill, we'll start with you for this question, which is about hate speech. What special efforts will you make to curb hate speech? Anti-Semitic, anti-refugee, anti-Muslim? Well, first of all, this is a nation of uh, immigrants, and uh, hate crime, it, it's a hate crime. We have, we have divided us, and we have done a very good job of dividing us. We have put labels on everybody that comes into this nation, and we all came from uh, immigrants. We need to stop. We need to put, stop putting labels on things. We need to stop putting labels on people. We are dividing us, and, and we need to stop. The, uh, if we're going to have a hate crime, well, then we need to punish that as a hate crime and, and send a strong message to, to these people. But we need to start getting along. It's just America. We have been divided, and I think we need to pull together. Thank you. Mr. Rourke? I think that, uh, obviously, that, I mean, this hate, uh, any type of hate speech, hate actions, activities, anything like that needs to be dealt with in the and to the extent of the law, and if the law needs to be tougher, then we need to look at doing some things like that. I think that though the root cause, again, would get back to education. We need to be ensuring that this is being dealt with in education, but, not, but also in families, too. I mean, this is a family responsibility of raising your kids in that way, too. So this has to be a joint responsibility of education, parents, and to, to ensure that these kids are learning the right examples, positive role models, not negative role models. And yeah, we see a lot of negative role models uh, around uh, right now. And we need to, I think, uh, set a better example for our kids. Um, we also need to fund more mental health services in our schools. Um, I've worked on that personally. I uh, worked on a budget amendment to put more Medicaid, the new Medicaid reimbursement for school-based mental health programs. I actually worked to get additional funding uh, in the budget on that issue, and I want to continue to work on that. I serve on the board of a mental health provider here in the area, and the biggest thing I've learned, uh, they also provide the screening for uh, depression and suicide in most of the schools here in the area, but the biggest thing I've learned is that this issue of bullying, of hate, of driving kids to possibly either mental health issues or suicide is real. And if we don't do a better job with it, both our families, it's not just the school's responsibilities, because I, I don't want to just blame the schools and dump it on them that they have to fix this. This is a parent issue as well. But we need to do more in this area, and I think that mental health services are a key area. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rorkas, we'll start with you on this question about voter ID. Please explain your position on voter ID and other legislation that makes it more difficult for citizens to vote. Um, I, I'm supportive of voter ID. I mean, most of the feedback that I have received from people, whether in the district or in the state, supports voter ID. Polls that we have seen <clears throat> supports voter ID. On a, on a practical level, I mean, you can't you can't rent a car without an ID. You can't rent a hotel without uh, a hotel room without an ID. Um, you, you, I mean, it, you pretty much, you go into any major city, you travel around the world. I've traveled to six of the seven continents, over 30 some different countries, both in personal and on business. If I didn't have my passport, I would have been 
pulled away pretty darn quickly if I didn't have my passport with me at all times. That was whether sometimes they wanted to see a passport just for me to pay for the meal to make sure that my credit card was valid. So I guess I, I, I just I don't understand that why it's uh, such a concern. Um, I, if, we, if there are significant barriers for people to get IDs, then we should address those at the state level. And I'm happy to figure out if we need to put more money to that, I'd be happy to figure out better ways to improve people's abilities to get IDs if they can't get them. But I think to go backwards on a law that is, to me, is just common sense, uh, when you have to give an ID for almost anything anymore. I still get carded for alcohol, because they card everybody for alcohol at Pick and Save. So, I mean, I have to show my ID if I buy alcohol. So, I, I guess I just, I, I'm sorry, I have, I have a hard time understanding why not to do that. But again, let's focus on getting people the ideas, and if there's barriers that need to be broken, or if there's something at the state that's hurting that, I'm happy to work on that, because I want more people voting. That's what we need to do. Thank you, Dan. I would support uh, automatic voter registration. I think everyone should be voted, voting. I think everyone should have that right. I think the lower class people do have a problem getting to the polls or getting a proper ID to vote. We need everybody to vote in this country to make it a true democracy. I would even support a, a law saying we need a, a voter day, just a voter day. This is the day we vote, people are off, we have, we have uh, holidays for everything else. Why not something like this? This is our democracy we're talking about. Why not make it available for everyone? Uh, I think we have uh, some places in this state where there is voter suppression, and I think it's real. Uh, I don't know how we're going to deal with that, but I, I think voter registration for everyone automatically would be a very good start, and I would support that 100%. Thank you. And Dan, we'll start with you on this question, which is about um, the burning of fossil fuels. 98% of world scientists agree that the burning of fossil fuels is the primary cause of global warming leading to climate change. Do you believe climate change is primarily affected by human beings? And how do you plan to address this critical issue if you are elected? I do believe we are in a big climate change. I think some of it's cyclable, but I also believe we are very we are hastening that process. And in the process, uh, we are seeing changes even in this state that I have never experienced in my life. Uh, who remembers here not having snow year after year after year? You can't tell me something's not happening. I went to Alaska last year, and when I went to those glaciers, those glaciers have melted five miles in a hundred years versus uh, a mile in a thousand years. So we are hastening something here, and we need to do something directly about it. And I hope we are not too late. But I think we should have been going green energy maybe 20 or 30 years ago. I was at a Blue Green Alliance, and I, I wish you to look this up. It's called the Blue Green Alliance. It's for working people that are interested in uh, green energy, and I think it's the future. 20, 20 years ago, I went to a, a conference, and they said that's going to be the jobs of the future. Our service, our, our country would be a service industry, and I thought, how can you have a country that doesn't make anything? Well, guess what, people? We are almost there. Our manufacturing jobs are gone, and they said green energy jobs, those are going to be the jobs of the future. And I think we were on that path, and all of a sudden we took a, 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 a diversion from it, and I believe it was because of money. Everything is about money in this in this country, and we have. We have corporationalized everything, and I think it's very wrong. We are doing it for our, we are doing it against our future hopes of our children and grandchildren, and on and on and on. So I think we need to do a green energy. You have countries all over the world going green energy. Why aren't we? It's because of money. Thank you. Mike same question. Oh, okay. um, so first, yes, I think I think climate change is occurring. You know, there, there could be there's people on both sides of it as to how much it's being caused by us, you know, you know the, and how much is just normal climate change that has occurred over time in, in a planet. I mean, if you look at the climates that have occurred well before the Industrial Revolution, 
there was significant climate change going back historically. At least that's what that's if you, for what I remember from science and geography or geology classes. Um, so it's been happening. The question is, is how much and what is the right balance in terms of balancing our energy needs to then ensuring that we are uh, responsible toward our environment. Um, I do think that we should be looking into new energy sources, multiple energy sources, because we're going to need them for multiple things. I would disagree um, with my opponent about manufacturing. Actually, manufacturing is showing a resurgence here in Wisconsin, uh, particularly in the last few years, and it has, and it is also in the Midwest. I mean, uh, Foxconn is coming, and I know maybe some people are against that, but they manufacture, they make things. Uh, and they, they make television screens, they want to make screens for healthcare, they want to make screens that will be in the automobile industry. So they're actually, they're, they're the first, this United, it's the first plant in the United States in years that's going to be making those kinds of screens here in the United States. So manufacturing is actually seeing a resurgence. We need manufacturing jobs. We also need to be looking at different energy sources in the future. And yeah, some of that could be green energy. Some of it's got to be better util utilization of electricity, figuring out better ways to store that power. Um, you should take a look. Look, Google microgrids. Look what Faith Technologies is looking into you know, in terms of that and storing energy in much smaller capacitors than what they, had, they, were, they used to have to do. And that's all designed to improve energy efficiency. So there's other potential options than just green energy. And I'm not an expert. Thank you, Mike. I've just learned about a number Sorry. of these things as a legislator. Sorry. Thank you. And I think this will have to be our last question. Um, and we'll start with you on this one too, Mike. And this question is about um, the jail population. Wisconsin Public Health Association and the League of Women Voters are currently addressing criminal justice reform as a priority issue. In Winnebago County, the Health Department and partners are concerned about the rising jail population and its effect on the health of our community. According to county officials, substance use and mental health have been named as the reasons for jail population increase. How will you reduce the jail population and provide support for residents as they re-enter our community? I think there's several things. I'm sorry, I was the one to go first. Or yes. it, okay. yes. I think there's several things. We need to uh, continue to expand the treatment alternative diversion programs through the courts to provide people treatment. We need to expand treatment programs for those individuals. The other thing, though, is we need to look at companies like Apricity. It used to be called Step Industries. They provide transitions for people who have addiction issues that are getting treatment. We need to provide more support to organizations like that, um, not only to help them to get them employment, but we also need to provide half kind of these houses for these individuals as well, whether the state does or through certain or, or um, their own or other resources. But you have to keep one of the best ways to get people not to continue uh, with drug issues is to keep them away from other people that are doing drugs. And so you have to maybe, you have to get them to physically live in a different place. If we don't do a couple of things like that, we're not really going to get to some of the root cause and have these people have the recidivism rate go back up. Um, so I would focus more on getting those people that are being put in jails, figuring out how to get them treatment. Uh, we, we have way too many people that end up in the jails and then if they don't get the treatment, then yeah, we're, that we're actually on the hook for it as a taxpayer. It's going to cost us more money in the long run. I would rather get them back uh, healthy and get them back into the workforce. Again, we have a workforce issue. We need anybody, everybody working that possibly can. And if somebody has drug addiction issues, they obviously may not be able to keep a full-time job. So we need to be doing more programs to get them working again. Could you repeat the question? Sure. The question is, how will you reduce the jail population and provide support for residents as they re-enter our community? Well, right now I think in, in Wisconsin we have a very high rate of, of black colored people in our prison system compared to most other states. So I think there's a, a, a maybe a possible poverty problem here or a, a drug problem. And, and Mike is right, uh, we, do, we do need to address those uh, uh, conditions when they come out of prison. They need help. They cannot just come out of a prison and, and 
be by themselves and be on their own, it's not going to work. They, they're probably going to go run right back to their, to their buddies and, and they're probably going to go right back to the drugs if that's what they were into. But I think as a society, we have a, a, a problem in our bigger cities with these drug problems and I think we need to address that problem and when they, they need help, you can't just let a guy go into prison and come back out and expect them it to be solved because it just doesn't work that way. Um, I, but I think we need to address why we have so many uh, college in there. There's got to be that reason. So I think there's a, a multifaceted problem here and, and solutions going on. So I think we need to really start looking into it a little more than we have. Now I'd like to invite each one of you to make a two-minute closing statement, starting with you, Dan. Well, whether I win or lose, it's been a journey. I think it's a very eye-opening journey. I think our political, political process is a little messed up right now. I, uh, but I think it's it's been fun. I've, 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 uh, I, I've met a lot of nice people. I think we can do a lot better in our state, and that's why I have chosen to run. My ideas might be a little radical, but maybe that's what we need, radicalism in this state. And, and we need to be thinking new ideas, because I don't feel like we are on the right path right now. I feel we can, we can make our schools better, our health care better. Uh, everything's better. I think we have, we, if, if we don't, if we've got a problem in the state, why don't we look at places like Minnesota that are doing better? We don't have to do exactly what they do, but I think if, if there's a state that's doing better, let's do it. Why not? I mean, I see a lot of problems in our state, and I think we need to address them before our state gets better. I, I, I always like to tell people, don't put labels on people. Because when we label things, we divide them. We do not be, need to be divided anymore in the state or the country, the district. We all need common ground. And we sure can find common ground, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. I feel like we need to change. So that's why I'm doing this. And I think it's important. So I, I hope we can get support no matter who you vote for. We need to do better. Thank you very much for all your attention and time. Great, thank you. I would like to close with, say, with basically saying, I think there's several key things to think about. I want to continue the positive economic reforms that have been that were started at over six years ago. We need to continue to keep our taxes down, lower them where possible, both income tax, property taxes, to encourage businesses continue to grow and invest. We need to use targeted incentives to bring companies like Foxconn into Wisconsin to keep Kimberly Clark here. We need to continue those positive policies. We also need to invest in, in areas that definitely will also build that, and that's in our education system. We put $636 million of new funding in this year, this past budget from the previous budget, and that went directly into, into the schools and for student um, learning. That's, those are the type of investments that we're able to do by having a strong economy. We're also able to put money into transportation. We do need a long-term fund fix, but we have money to fund our roads, as been evidenced by 41, 441. Go through the zoo exchange. It's actually making progress down there. Um, we have areas that we've included in health care as well. We're going to lower those rates, so those increased rates for people on the exchange by taking advantage of, the, of certain dollars at the, Medi at the federal Medicaid level. We need to look for additional creative ways to do that. Um, there is a lot of good things going on in the state of Wisconsin, and I hope to continue that by working on the budget com committee, being fiscally responsible, but then investing new dollars into other areas that also need, I haven't even mentioned, like elder care. We've got a growing Alzheimer's and dementia issue in the state. We need to be putting more funding into those areas. And last, I'm going to just close with, uh, this was probably the most, uh, I think, my most significant accomplishment, and it was a bill that an individual here in Nina brought to my attention. 
She talked to me about breast tissue density, and if you don't know about it, you should probably, I would suggest you look into it. I knew nothing about it, but as a result of her, we passed a bill that actually improves women's knowledge and their ability to know more about their health and to hopefully lead to earlier diagnosis. She didn't have any money to give me. The, the, some of the hospitals were against it, but it was the right policy thing. That's why I pushed it. That's why I fought for it. It passed unanimously and the governor signed it into law. That was my most significant thing that I found most personally rewarding, and I hope to do that again for you. I ask for your vote on November 6th. Sorry I went longer. <laughs>